Okay, we're looking at eternal rewards and temporal benefits, focusing primarily on Matthew 22 and parallel passages. We've got all the way down to Matthew 22, 14. We hit 22, 13, where a guest arrived at the wedding banquet in the millennial kingdom on the earth, which is the wedding banquet of Jesus Christ and his second coming as he is celebrating the wedding banquet to his marriage in heaven with the bride of Christ, the church. And many of the church and other believers will be invited, all will be invited. <clears throat> uh, but they will not be uh, allowed to attend if they don't wear the proper wedding clothes, which implies, have you been faithful in this mortal life? So the king then told the attendants, tie him, the unfaithful believer, hand and foot, and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Relative darkness and a wedding banquet to what is outside, which in wedding banquets in the first century, there were no light, street lights. It was, you could, it was pitch black, pitch dark. Uh, but the uh, wedding banquet itself would be well lit with all kinds of candles and, and lights and uh, bright. Uh, and uh, for many are invited, verse 22, 14, but few were chosen. Many are invited. All are invited into the wedding banquet who are believers. There aren't any unbelievers invited because they'll be gone. They're not invited into the kingdom of God and then into the wedding banquet as a celebration of the, of the wedding between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. So all tears will be wiped away eventually, though. And the regret will be just for a season. While there will be a season of regret and remorse and weeping and gnashing of teeth, tears will be wiped away on into eternity future. <clears throat> this is relative especially to the believer who recognizes the loss of rewards that he could have had had he been uh, persevered in the faith and uh, reached out and uh, joined the, uh, the, the point of view of Christians to serve the Lord and not be enamored of the temporal life. It's either one or the other. Compromise between the two, and you got neither. Uh, because you have one hand in, in the temporal life, and you uh, then you whittle down the, the uh, doctrines of the faith and serve only as you decide to serve instead of as the Lord brings opportunity to you, which is worthless then. So, Revelation 21 1 to 4a. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, <clears throat> and there's no longer any sea. This is for believers. Unbelievers don't get to be into the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, notice that the setting of this passage is the commencement of the new heaven and the new earth when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. <clears throat> Old Testament has some passages on that. In Ezekiel, for example. And I saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be among them. And at this time every tear shall be wiped away. And he shall wipe away, wipe away every tear from their eyes. All saved people, Revelation 20. You have to look at what Revelation 20 had to offer. Let's just take a look. We have a, a great uh, setup here online uh, on my laptop. Four windows. Interlinear, seven versions, Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, commentaries. Let's look at, I like the NASB, oops, some commentaries, okay, let's go back to look at the NASB, let's blow this one corner up to the whole page, and look at Revelation 20, see how it leads in to Revelation 21, oops, Revelation 20. Revelation 20, the very end. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, 
and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, uh, the great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged for the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. These are the unbelievers. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and this is the second death, the lake of fire. And any, if anyone's name was not found in written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So all unbelievers are gone. Now we go to Revelation 21. Back to where we were before. Revelation 21, 4a. And he shall wipe away every tear from, from their eyes. All saved people, because that's all that remains. Compare Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe away tears away from all faces. So heaven promises different levels of reward and capacity of enjoyment. The millennium and eternity future will be spent by the believers in varying capacities of enjoyment. For example, consider the difference between the capacity of a maestro musician to enjoy the wonderful music that he himself is playing to an audience as opposed to someone in his audience who is listening but has very little musical talent and is thus enjoying what is being played at a much lower level of enjoyment. Compare the following. The man who had received the five talents in Matthew 25, 20 brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Wow, congratulatory. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So you're going to be happy when you get to eternity, except for that 1,000-year period of millennial rule if you weren't faithful. Uh, if you were, you're going to come and share all the more in their master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained more. And his master replied the same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in, with a few things, with a few things that he gave them to be faithful. Each one is given a different capacity and set of things to be faithful with, and uh, you have to live up to the optimum of your capacity for those things, and you get rewarded equally, even though somebody else may have more to do or less. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Same message. So in obedient response to the master's request for an accounting, in verse 19, the first two servants told of the results of their efforts. There is no self-pride being emphasized here, just simple obedience in giving the requested account. The master's response was a well done, and much more than that, for he called each one of them a good and faithful servant. An emphasis is placed on the faithfulness of the two servants to their responsibilities and not on the gross amount of their productivity. There was absolutely no distinction made between the first servant who, uh, who outproduced the second by 21, uh, two and a half times. The verses which commend the two servants' faithfulness are purposely identical. Verses 21 and 23. God in his sovereignty has decreed different gifts, different divine good production capacities and responsibilities for his kingdom to different individuals. He's, he rewards according to the individual's faithful obedience to his assigned tasks. Luke 12:48b correlates this, corroborates this. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be more will be asked. Then the master in the parable in Matthew 25 gives the faithful servants responsibility over many things, each one of them that were faithful. Finally, notice that the master invites both faithful servants to come and share your master's happiness. The faithful servants, faithful believers, are enjoined to share in the joy of the Lord, to celebrate and partake of God's indescribable divine happiness. The letter to the Colossian believers, Colossians 1-2, speaks, these are believers, Colossians 1-2, speaks of the consequences of faithful and unfaithful Christian service. Colossians 3, 23-25 Whatever you do, do your work heartily for, as, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that for the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. It's not the inheritance of eternal life which is by faith alone, but the reward of inheritance co-rulership and ownership in the kingdom of God. Sad to say this will not be so for the unfaithful believer, who will be weeping and gnashing his teeth over severe disappointment at his eternal loss of rewards when he does get into heaven, and which inevitably will be because he's a believer. This weeping and gnashing to last only for a season 
then the Lord will wipe away every tear. Isaiah 25, 8, Revelation 21, 4, which we just read. And then Colossians 3.25, For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. And we're talking about believers. So, the difference in heaven will be in opportunities and levels of service. Of the many things heaven will be, it will not be born. Our heavenly perfection, for example, will not be a matter simply of never making a mistake, nor will it be always making a hole in one or a home run, as it were. Rather, it would be a time of ever-expanding and increasingly joyous service. And the saints who then will serve the, Lord the most and rejoice the, rejoice the most will be those who have served the Lord most steadfastly while on earth. Every soul in heaven will equally possess eternal life and will be equally righteous and equally Christ-like and equally glorious. Everyone will be equally perfect because perfection has no degrees. The difference will be in opportunities and levels of service. Just as the angels serve God in ranks, so will redeemed men and women, men and women, and the degree of their heavenly service will have been determined by the devotedness of their earthly service. So MacArthur continues to write, Heavenly will not heaven will not involve differing qualities of service because everything in heavenly is perfect. Everything done for the Lord will be perfectly right and perfectly satisfying. There will be no distinctions of superiority or inferiority. For there will be no envy, jealousy, or any other remnant of sinful human nature. Whatever one's rank or responsibility or opportunity, those will be God's perfect will for that individual, and therefore will be perfectly enjoyed. In a way that is beyond our present comprehension, believers will, after a season of reckoning, when they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's in the thousand-year millennial rule, before the weeping and uh, gnashing of teeth is washed away, or tears are washed away, believers will be both equal and unequal in the eternal state. The parallel parable in Luke 19 provides additional support for this. Luke 19, 12-19. He said, Therefore, a certain nobleman went out to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minus and, received, and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent the delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. And it came about that when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves, to whom he had given the money, be called to him in order that he might know what business they had done. And the first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing, being authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five cities. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. The second servants did not receive a well done, however, his work being productive but not up to expectation, as was the first servants. Notice that the faithful servants were put in charge of ten and five cities in the kingdom. There is a good possibility that faithful believers will indeed be placed in authority over towns, cities, and countries. For two, Timothy 2.12 and Revelation 20.46 indicate that co-ruling with Christ is what is in store for the faithful believer. Is Matthew 25, 24 to 26. Then the man who had received the tip one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what I what belongs to you. His master replied, You wizzy, wicked, lazy servant. So you know, knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Verses 20 to 22. Of the parable, parable in Luke 19 provides additional insight into this point. And another came, saying, Master, behold, your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man, and you take up what you did not lay down, and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I do not did not lay down, and reaping what I did not sow? The harvest where you have not sown and gather where you have not scattered, seed is not necessarily evil at all. The Apostle Paul indicates that this is not only acceptable, but in essence decreed by our Lord, our sovereign God, when one is doing the Lord's work. So we go back to the Matthew passage. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. In Luke 19, 24 to 27, and he said to the bystanders, Take the mina, mina, 
away from him and give it to the one who has the ten 